The 18th Street Gang is one of the largest and most violent street gangs in the United States with a long history of criminal activity, including drug trafficking, arson, extortion, and murder committed by members who ended up being captured and imprisoned. Today, we'll look at the rise and fall of their deadliest hitmen and the impact of their activities. History and Activities The 18th Street Gang goes by different names. They're also called Barrio 18, Mara 18, Kale 18, or simply LA 18. The gang is a multi-ethnic international criminal organization that began as a Los Angeles street gang. With over 65,000 members from the United States, Mexico, and Central America, it is one of the greatest international criminal gangs in Los Angeles. The gang also has ties to the Mexican Mafia, another US-based crime syndicate. This union, however, has not always been peaceful as the two parties have had a tumultuous history throughout the years. The gang began at 18th Street and Union Avenue in Los Angeles' Rampart District. Although there is some disagreement on the precise area, it is largely accepted by most scholarly sources. They were previously part of Clanton 14, but decided to start their own clique called Clanton 18th Street and encourage immigrants to join. The Clanton 14 rejected this idea, resulting in the formation of the 18th Street Gang. Since then, the two gangs have been bitter rivals. It expanded its membership to include people of all nations and races. It was one of the first multiracial, multi-ethnic gangs in Los Angeles. Initially, they were mostly made up of second-generation Hispanics. However, the gang began recruiting from beyond the Spanish-speaking community as they engaged in battle with more established Hispanic gangs. About 200 autonomous gangs operate in different barrios throughout the San Fernando Valley, specifically in the San Gabriel Valley, Long Beach, Riverside, South Los Angeles, and several others. Formerly a Mexican-American gang, 18th Street became Central American as it attracted members from various ethnicities. As Central American gang members were captured in the United States, they were deported back to Central America, where the gang grew out of control on many levels of violence, not just in El Salvador, but also in Honduras and Guatemala, becoming one of Central America's most dangerous gangs. According to the Department of Justice, the 18th Street Gang and rival gang, MS-13, have turned the Central American Northern Triangle into the world's highest homicide zone. This is owing to the gang's rampant violence and crime, which have taken over entire neighborhoods and cities across the region. While these gangs vied for supremacy in Central America, the 18th Street Gang became a bitter foe of MS-13. The majority of 18th Street Gang members are Guatemalans, Hondurans, and Salvadorans. However, the gang also has members from several parts of Central America. In El Salvador, in 2005, a faction known as the Revolucionarios, or Revolutionaries, separated from the 18th Street Gang, becoming enemies with the other members, who became known as the Surios, or Southerners. As a result of this separation, there was a large increase in violence as the two factions battled for control of territory and power. To maintain control and mark their territory, the 18th Street Gang had a number of deadly hitmen, including number 1. William Vasquez William Vasquez was a prominent gang member convicted of murdering five individuals in Los Angeles and Santa Monica over a three-year period. His defense team attempted to argue that the evidence did not support some of his convictions. However, presiding judge Norman L. rejected their allegations on behalf of a three-judge panel from California's Second District Court of Appeals. On the evening of March 5th, police and paramedics were dispatched to the Moose Lodge in Santa Monica in response to reports of a gunshot. They arrived to find Hector Bonilla and Jonathan Hernandez dead from multiple gunshot wounds. Imelda Martinez, who had been at her brother Ruben's birthday celebration earlier that day at the Moose Lodge, was questioned by the police. She admitted that she ran into the defendant, who she recognized as William Vasquez. William was a friend of Ruben's and had previously slept at her house. Imelda noticed William's long sleeve blood red shirt and couldn't recall seeing anybody else at the party wearing a shirt that red. This information is critical because Imelda sank to the ground when the gunshots began. When she glanced up, she saw something red and her immediate assumption was that William was the shooter. She said William's shirt stood out because it was more casual and everybody else was a little bit more dressed up. As the shots were being fired, Imelda noticed the arm of the individual wearing the red shirt pointing 45 degrees downward. Imelda, however, found it difficult to identify the shooter's face due to the dim lighting in the room. Imelda told her cousin, her cousin's husband, and some friends that the person in the red shirt carrying out the shooting was the same person who had previously stayed at her home on the evening of the shooting. That individual was William. Imelda identified William's picture during a police interrogation on July 25th, 2005. Ruben Martinez corroborated her story. Ruben had reserved the Moose Lodge for his birthday celebration and spent most of the event in the bar area. He heard popping noises and realized there had been a shooting. According to Ruben, he saw William at the gathering and William stood out because of his red clothing, which included a red cap and shirt. As they walked around the dance floor and waved their bandanas, four or five members of the Santa Monica gang shouted about their territory and neighborhood. Ruben also observed them at the party 
party. Reuben knew William belonged to the 18th Street Gang, a Bloods competitor. William was a neighbor and had stayed at Reuben's house. Reuben did not disclose to the police that he knew William, even though he recognized the image as that of William. Although he denied being scared to provide information, he admitted telling the police, you know how it is on the street, and that he did not want to attend court. You are ejected if you utter a word. William even visited Imelda's house a few days after the incident and asked if any security cameras were at the Moose Lodge. There was also Salvador Ramirez, who attended the party and recognized William there, a person he had previously met in the neighborhood. He also stated that William was sporting a red baseball cap and shirt. Enrique Larios, another witness, confirmed that he was at the Moose Lodge the night of the shooting. He heard gunshots and saw flashing lights in the main room. Larios observed a man wearing a red shirt firing a gun toward the dance floor. In court, Larios identified William as the shooter. Additionally, the prosecution provided proof that the defendant belonged to the 18th Street Gang, and that gang rivalry was the driving force behind the shooting. The 18th Street Gang and the Santa Monica Gang were known rivals. Since the Santa Monica Gang members were at Ruben Martinez's party, it seems likely that the shooting was retaliatory. William claimed in his defense that he was not present the night of the incident at the Moose Lodge. He said he was at home with his girlfriend watching movies. This is of course a laughable claim, considering that the prosecution provided proof that the defendant made multiple calls from the area of the Moose Lodge close to the time of the incident, according to the records of his own phone. The defense also tried to cast doubt on the witnesses' claims that William was the assailant. They contended that the chaotic and traumatic nature of the incident made the eyewitness's memory untrustworthy. The prosecution answered with the evidence showing that throughout the initial police interviews, the witnesses had offered consistent descriptions of the shooter's attire and physical characteristics. Following a lengthy trial, William was convicted of two charges of first-degree murder. He received a life sentence without the chance of release. The judge also added an additional 156 years to his sentence. William Vasquez may have shot his rivals to show his gang superiority, but some other 18th Street gang hitmen operate without even firing a gun. Allow me to introduce you to number two, Francisco Puppet Martinez. Francisco Martinez was not your regular gangster. He oversaw several violent crimes and killed a number of people. His reign of terror was thought to have ended when he was finally convicted and put behind bars, but that wasn't the end of it. In the late 1990s, a federal jail cell served as the command center for gang warfare and narcotics trafficking in LA's MacArthur Park. Francisco Puppet Martinez was in charge of the Columbia Lil Psychos group of the 18th Street Gang. He gave orders to his wife and his loyal soldiers from his prison cell. It sounds like something from a movie, doesn't it? But sadly, this is real life and Martinez was ultimately found guilty of multiple other offenses, as well as the first racketeering charges brought against gang members in Los Angeles. He is now incarcerated for three lifetimes. It's incredible to consider how much of the local gang activities one man might manage from behind bars. How did he manage to do it? Martinez, it seems, had a nest egg of almost $450,000 in narcotics and extortion proceeds stashed away in his wife's apartment. Thanks to court-ordered phone taps on Martinez's wife, authorities were able to secure a search warrant for the flat. While the FBI was performing the search, Martinez intentionally dialed Garcia's home and spoke with her sister, Olga Hamilton. The FBI also captured that exchange. It's crazy to think that Martinez was still able to have a direct line of communication with his people, even when the authorities were hot on his trail. However, this is merely the very beginning. Authorities believed that, like the Italian Mafia, the so-called Mexican Mafia operates and rules the streets from federal prisons. They are held in high regard and viewed as demigods by other prisoners. Richard Valdemar, a retired LA Sheriff's deputy who served on the FBI task force to dismantle the 18th Street gang in the 1990s, claims that imprisoning gang leaders has only helped the Mexican Mafia. Members find ways to communicate with the street gangs while imprisoned, and their underground secret network only increases their strength. Some of these individuals are smart, admits Valdemar. We can't see gang members as stupid stupid children who dropped out of school and immediately embraced the life of a thug. No, these individuals who rose to the top of the prison gang food chain are intelligent and could lead large corporations if they chose. It's somewhat unsettling to consider how these gang leaders, who are meant to be imprisoned and isolated, can exert such powerful influence from behind bars. But it also demonstrates their brains and ingenuity. So, how can this be stopped? Answering that question is challenging. As we have seen with the Mexican Mafia, Imprisoning gang leaders may not be the best course of action. They seem to get stronger as a result. Maybe more funds should be allocated to deter young people from becoming members of gangs in the first place. Those who may otherwise choose a life of crime may find an alternate path through education, job training, and other alternatives. It is incredible how Martinez is able to control gang violence and the drug trade from his prison cell. It makes sense that his supporters in the Mexican Mafia treated him like a god, but other criminal organizations also control the streets from federal prison, not just the Mexican Mafia. Numerous other gangs operate in the same way, according to authorities. These gangs are made so much more dangerous by the underground covert system they employ to give commands to their soldiers on the streets. However, despite these difficulties, law enforcement organizations have achieved great progress in recent years in battling gang violence and the drug trade. According to Bruce Riordan, who handled the Martinez case as a federal prosecutor, 
Federal informants and wiretaps allow for the imprisonment of top-tier gang leaders. He maintains that the cases involving gang leaders are comparable in size and importance to the ones that brought down the five New York families. This demonstrates the commitment and effort put out by law enforcement organizations in the fight against gang violence and the drug trade. Many of these gang leaders are bright, capable people. Had they made different decisions, they may have found success in other areas. However, once kids join a gang, it's frequently challenging for them to leave since they fear reprisals and have few other options. This is why it's important to address the underlying factors contributing to gang violence and the drug trade, such as poverty, illiteracy, and social inequality. We can lessen the appeal of gangs and stop young people from joining this risky lifestyle by giving them better options and alternatives. Apart from poverty and illiteracy, the allure of power and greed can lead even educated and well-earning professionals to work for the gang. How else can you explain Luis Garcia's testimony on Gabriel Zendejas Chavez? Number 3. Luis Hefty Garcia Former Surio gangster and Mexican Mafia ally Luis Hefty Garcia was arrested and tried for several crimes he committed as a gangster, including attempted murder. Garcia cooperated with prosecutors against Gabriel Zendejas Chavez, an attorney, to get a reduction in his sentence despite having already entered into his plea agreement. Garcia, a 43-year-old prison inmate, claimed that Chavez was a middleman for the Mexican Mafia who exploited his legal standing to acquire access to people in the most repressive prisons in the U.S. Garcia claims that Chavez served as the vital link between members transmitting information regarding possible murder conspiracies and other important business choices. Garcia, the key witness for the prosecution, is attempting to avoid a potential life sentence for attempted murder by testifying. He has admitted to all his previous offenses, including an uncharged attempted murder that he acknowledged on the witness stand. Operation Dirty Thirds, a levy the mafia placed on drug sales inside the jails, is the subject of Garcia and Chavez's testimonies. As part of a multi-year investigation, federal prosecutors unveiled two indictments in May 2018 against 83 people. With his his plea agreement already in place, Garcia might obtain a reduction in sentence through his assistance with prosecutors against Chavez. Garcia and Chavez were among those charged. Garcia referred to himself in his testimony as a rat, which he defined as a person who is doing what I'm doing now. In recent years, the Orange County Mexican Mafia has been the target of multiple high-profile indictments by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California, including a 33-count, 31-defendant indictment made public in April. Chavez's trial offers a unique look inside one of the country's most brutal and powerful criminal organizations. Established in California state jails in the 1960s and presently has 140 full-fledged members and a large network of friends. This is not the first time a lawyer has been accused of aiding the Mexican Mafia. A federal jury in Los Angeles found disbarred lawyer Isaac Guillen guilty of money laundering and racketeering in 2012 for his involvement with the Mafia and its support of the 18th Street Gang. He received a prison term of approximately seven years. Most people believe that the seven-year jail term is too lenient for someone like him. Chavez is charged with succeeding Guillen and elevating himself to the position of chief facilitator, similar to Garcia. Prosecutors contend that Chavez assisted the Mexican Mafia in making decisions about violence and its control over lucrative drug markets by assisting in smuggling cocaine into jails, tracking informants, and obtaining paperwork. His nickname among the group was La Corbata, which is Spanish for the tie. Chavez is also charged with aiding and managing an extortion scheme against the Mongols Motorcycle Club, which involved requiring the group to pay $100,000 to be taken off the Mexican Mafia's list of people who may be killed on site but necessitated broad support from the Mafia membership. Gangs like Garcia Sureños and the MS-13 answer to the Mexican Mafia, also known as La M. When Garcia was running the LA jails as an inmate with Mexican Mafia member Jose Fox Landa Rodriguez, he testified that he was being assisted by numerous secretaries from the outside because there was a lot to do. The group has strict rules and a chain of command that includes secretarial roles. Luis Hefty Garcia testified that Chavez provided a quick way to communicate with high-ranking Mexican Mafia members. Garcia frequently met with Chavez under the pretense of an attorney-client meeting. During his two days on the witness stand, Garcia claimed that Chavez served as a middleman for the Mexican Mafia and used his position as an attorney to obtain exclusive access to members held in maximum security facilities. Chavez is currently on trial for his alleged involvement in controlling lucrative drug markets, pursuing informants, and smuggling cocaine into jails. Garcia stated that Chavez also served as an important conduit for information regarding potential murder plots and other significant business choices amongst prisoners in various institutions. Garcia claimed that he frequently met with Chavez while posing as an attorney client and that Chavez gave him a quick way to communicate with inmates in maximum security facilities like ADX Florence in Colorado and Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California. Garcia stated that important Mexican Mafia choices, such as who has to be killed, were made with the help of members of the organization who were detained at ADX Florence. These members included Francisco Puppet Martinez and Adolf Champ Reynoso. However, communication with some of these members was extremely challenging, if not impossible, due to super 
for Max constraints at ADX Florence. Garcia claimed in court that he had no way of contacting Mexican Mafia members in ADX Colorado besides Chavez. Garcia faces a life sentence after he confessed to a series of unconfirmed murders, but it is believed that his cooperation will earn him a lesser sentence. For some hitmen, their only worry is the bullet of a rival gang, while others have to worry about both the rival gang's bullets and possible execution from their own gang. This is the case for Giovanni. Number 4. Giovanni Giovanni is a former hitman for Barrio 18, but is also gay. In a gang culture where homosexuality is considered a capital offense, Giovanni was forced to hide his true identity. He led a double life, juggling his sexuality while navigating the dangerous world of gang participation. Giovanni bravely decided to leave the gang and live as a gay guy in public in 2016. However, this choice had a high cost. He was put in an isolation cell with his lover and eight other gay inmates, all of whom had formerly belonged to one of the nation's three major organized crime organizations. They needed to be isolated because they would have been killed if they were to stay with the other imprisoned gang members. This sort of queer romance was unheard of in gang culture. On the outside, these groups would have been at each other's throats, but in their isolation cells, they have found a way to cooperate and live in harmony. The filmmaker Marlene Vinayo and the journalist Carlos Martinez documented the story of Giovanni in his isolation cell. In their film, Unforgivable, the former gang members give a nuanced picture of their experiences, which includes Giovanni's struggle to reconcile his violent past with his new identity. Thanks to the documentary, we were able to see the living conditions and hear from the ex-18th gang hitman who struggles with his violent history and sexuality. Being a member of the dreaded 18th Street, Giovanni committed nasty and violent crimes, and he admits that it was easy for him to kill someone, but he finds it difficult to accept his homosexuality, which he sees as abnormal, and who could blame him? The 18th Street gang's initiation process will harden anyone and soften the devil's heart. The gang is infamous for its initiation process, which consists of getting beaten for 18 seconds or engaging in unlawful actions at the request of an existing member. Women can join the gang by a variety of means, including including an 18-second beating, having sex with numerous members, or becoming the girlfriend or wife of a member. Veteranos, or veterans, from the gang's central nervous system, which operates in semi-autonomous groups known as cliques, no military-style command structure exists. The gang's structure varies by region. The gang acts differently in Central America, where MS-13 is its main foe. Due to internal disagreements about operations and instructions to follow, the gang divided into two sections in El Salvador in 2005. The splintering of 18th Street is unique to El Salvador, and its structure in Central America is less unified and discipline. Giovanni discusses the contrast between his love for his partner and the brutal life he led as a gang member in the movie. It was brave of him to leave the gang and live freely as a gay man, but there were also considerable hazards involved. Given that they abandoned the gang and openly lived as homosexual men, he and the other gay inmates in the isolation cell are already detested by society. They wouldn't know where to go if they ever got out of jail. According to Vineo, one of them said the only solution would be to live in the sewer. The documentary also highlights how evangelical churches are becoming more prevalent in El Salvador, with gang members frequently turning to religion as a means of personal development and atonement for past sins. These churches provide a unique exit from gang life. In the Gotera jail, where Giovanni was detained, evangelical pastors had converted almost all prisoners to Christianity. They have effectively ceded control of daily life to church leaders, who preach that homosexuality is a sin as grave as violence. This teaching is seen as controversial, and many people have pointed out that it could lead to violence and bigotry. The church's expanding influence on daily life significantly decreased violence in Gotera while enabling members of various gangs to coexist. An uncommon common occurrence for sure. However, some pastors' troubling messages such as equating homosexuality with being a beast or animal raised concerns. Giovanni's tragedy is not exceptional in El Salvador, where the nation's deadly gang culture has resulted in hundreds of deaths over the past 10 years. Giovanni was convicted of several crimes, including murder and sexual assault, and is serving life in prison. The 18th Street Gang is prominent in the US, and the country has made it a sort of law to deport anyone convicted of gangster activities. This is the thinking behind the deportation of Jose Miguel. Number 5. Jose Miguel Hernandez Garcia. On February 21, 2022, ERO Philadelphia was informed of an active arrest warrant for Hernandez Garcia in addition to an administrative deportation order. According to Salvadoran law enforcement officials, he was a verified leader and hitman of the notorious 18th Street Gang in El Salvador and was wanted for aggravated homicide. While it is easy to cast aspersions on gang leaders and rightly jail them, the root of these reigns of violence and drug abuse must also be tackled. The living conditions in some parts of El Salvador make young men and women readily available to do anything for cash. They has been a rising realization recently that gang violence is a symptom of a bigger socio-economic concern such as poverty, inequality, and a lack of opportunity. Many supporters feel tackling these factors is critical to reducing gang involvement and violence. This strategy entails investing in education, job training, and community development in underserved areas. Notwithstanding the difficulties, there have been some successes in the fight against gang violence. In Los Angeles, for instance, gang-related fatalities have decreased dramatically in recent years, thanks in part to collaborative efforts of community-based organizations 
organizations and police enforcement authorities. Community-based organizations have also aided in the fight against gang violence. Former gang members have received job training, education, and support services from organizations such as Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. These groups seek to provide alternatives to gang life, while also addressing the underlying causes that drive young people to join gangs in the first place. While much work remains to be done, these initiatives promise a future with less gang violence and greater possibilities for young people in neglected communities. Despite the gang's violent history, many members say they joined for security and a sense of belonging. Gangs such as 18th Street frequently provide a sense of belonging and camaraderie, lacking in impoverished communities. Many members came from shattered homes and have dealt with poverty, violence, and abuse. In other cases, joining a gang is considered a way to get out of a bad position. On the other hand, the reality of gang life is far from glamorous. Members are frequently threatened physically by competing gangs, law enforcement, and even their own members. They are also constantly threatened with arrest and incarceration. Many gang members develop drug and alcohol addictions, and many die at a young age as a result of violence or drug-related reasons. This gang has left a bloody trail, with 18th Streeters beating or robbing someone in Los Angeles County every day on average. They have been linked to high-profile kidnappings and murders, including that of Honduran football player Wilson Palacio's 16-year-old brother, not to mention the horrific instance of Officer Filbert Cuesta, who was shot in the back of the head and killed by Catarino Gonzalez, who was sentenced to life in prison. The 18th Street Gang has produced difficulties throughout the world, not just in the United States. For example, many bus drivers in Guatemala City have been assassinated by gang members while driving through the group's supposed territory. Bus drivers were frequently the targets of robberies and extortion. The gang has been known to act against individuals who refuse to pay. Many experts have also faulted the United States' habit of sending convicted gangsters and hitmen back to their nations. They argue that these gangsters go back home and become even more powerful. That will probably be the case with Jose Hernandez Garcia, who was incarcerated in the Pennsylvania Department of Prisons for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. According to the Immigration Nationality Act, he was a removable alien since he had been found guilty of an aggravated offense. Jose Miguel Hernandez Garcia was successfully extradited to El Salvador in March 2022 by Enforcement and Removal Operations, ERO, agents of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. Hernandez Garcia was wanted for aggravated homicide in El Salvador. The current status of the 18th Street Gang in the late 1990s, the FBI and local enforcement agencies apprehended some of the Barrio 18's top leaders, hoping to slow the gang's growth. Nevertheless, rather than destroying the gang, it provided them with a new base from which to operate and recruit new members, federal prisons. Despite efforts to keep the gang leaders isolated from their contacts on the outside, they find means to continue running illegal operations from within the prison walls. As the gang extended throughout Central America and Mexico, governments responded with severe iron fist tactics that encouraged the gangs to restructure and regroup, increasing their strength and influence. Barrio 18 and MS-13, which began as street gangs, grew to fill the void left by weak police forces and a relatively open criminal landscape, posing a substantial threat to national security. Barrio 18 and MS-13 reached a statewide peace in 2012, negotiated by a government envoy and the Catholic Church. The murder rate in El Salvador fell dramatically. Still, there were concerns about the gang's rising political stature and criminal skill. There have also been reports of an informal agreement between El Salvador's government and imprisoned gang leaders, with the latter supposedly agreeing to reduce homicides in in exchange for better prison conditions. The coronavirus pandemic provided the gang with both chances and economic challenges, building local support in certain regions while increasing structural flaws in others. As the virus spread over the world, the Barrio 18 faced new obstacles. The lockdowns and travel restrictions hampered the gang's illicit activities. This resulted in increased violence and struggle with other gangs for scarce resources. Despite the efforts of US law enforcement and Central American governments, the Barrio 18 thrives, exhibiting endurance and flexibility in the face of adversity. Despite difficulties, the Barrio 18 gang remains a big menace to the region. Their operations go beyond drug trafficking and extortion, since the gang has been linked to a variety of other illegal acts, such as human trafficking, arms trafficking, and money laundering. Government efforts to suppress the gang have frequently been fruitless, since policies such as Mano Dura have simply served to strengthen the group by locking its members up and providing them with a captive audience from which to recruit. The truce between the Barrio 18 and MS-13 was a rare moment of success, but it proved untenable. Long-term solutions to Central America's gang problem will include a multi pronged approach that targets the core reasons for gang formation, such as poverty, lack of opportunity, and social marginalization. Until then, the Barrio 18 and other gangs will thrive in the area, fueling violence and instability. The 18th Street Gang's deadliest hitmen may be behind bars. Still, their legacy of violence and terror remains a stark reminder of the gang's destructive impact. What happened to the 18th Street Gang's deadliest hitmen is quite interesting, and if you'd want to see something more interesting, hit the card on your screen. I'll see you there.